first time you're hearing his name mentioned. He was most well known later on for being the uh, creative force and the manager of Zanzibar, but he was born in 1943 to a 14-year-old single mother. Uh, by the late 60s and early 70s, he was known for giving fashion shows and house parties. And in 74, he started Le Jacques in collaboration with Daryl and Jamie McDonald, the designer, Tommy Garrett, the model, Marvin Davis, and Marvin's sister Donna is here tonight, which is so nice. It's the first time I got to meet her. Okay. Uh, so, Daryl, having known Al so well, what can you say to help people understand where this man came from? And That's a good question. Where did he come from? Because he was great. Um, Al Murphy was a visionary. Um, he, okay. he was a visionary. He had such, um, such a mind. Um, and he, I think Al loved to create, um, he loved to uh, mold people. He was a molder. He just liked to take people and change them into, 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 into these great individuals. Al Murphy was a visionary. He just, he, he was an amazing man. Like his, his, his skill for decorating was amazing. I mean, he could take anything and just change it and just mold it into something fantastic. That's true about the Zanzibar um, and the doves. That was really great. I mean, it, it gave you a sense of, of warmth. Um, and um, I could recall when Manning made, was, was commissioned to do the piece on the wall. The wall was actually commissioned. The model for the wall was this woman named Sherry Gordon. She was a model named Sherry Gordon. And Sherry was the instrument behind it. She was the muse for, for this particular piece. And uh, again, it did come out like a drag queen. But it was just, it was a piece of work, a work of art. Um, Al Murphy was just the most, the most kindest person that you could have as a friend. But he was also one, like a lot of us, are not the ones to rub against and have as an enemy. Um, Al would take young kids and um, create like fashion shows. He would, he would do his fashion shows. Al loved, he had a thing for, there was a model back in the days called, uh, her name was Emily Miles. And Al Murphy, he emulated Emily Miles. That was his, that was his muse. Mm -hmm. You know, Emily Miles was like this great woman who was a fashion um, illustrator and model. And she would do fashion shows and Al emulated her. Um, that's basically it. I mean, a lot has just been said, but that's basically it um, as far as with Al Murphy. Can you say something about uh, when you got out of high school, you graduated in 1971 and now started showing you around oh, lower yeah. Manhattan? Well, and when that I period first is so interesting because yeah. it's right after Stonewall. And Again, like I said, I would like, take kids, young kids, and mold them into, um, <laughs> just mold them into creations, wonderful creations. Like if you had some sort of gift, a designer, he would encourage you to design. If you were to be a model, he would encourage you to be a model. <coughs> well, my first, I came out of high school. The night that I came out of high school, Al took, I took a bunch, bunch of us over to a club called, um, it was called the Planetarium. And the Planetarium was designed, it had a metal floor, and it just had like lights and stuff like uh, orbits. It was just very, very beautiful. But the thing, the, the catch to the planetarium was everybody wore metal on their shoes. So you just heard, tch, 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 you just said what you heard because the floor was a metal floor and you had taps and you couldn't have taps big enough, you know. But that was one of the things. And then later on he introduced me to the club called 
the, it was called um, uh, the Loft. And the Loft was like an amazing club that you could mm -hmm. not, the Loft was like the, the Studio 54 of its day, mm -hmm. where you could not get in. If you, if you went to Studio, if you went to the Loft, you either had someone call in or you could not get in. And my calling person was Marvin Davis. I would always call Marvin Davis to get me in. Um, the, the, the membership card was designed like the Little Rascals, um, with Petey and, and, and all of the little, the characters of the Little Rascals. And um, that was David Mancuso. That was David Mancuso's. And he, he was close to Larry Patterson. He was close well to Larry well. Patterson. Um, Marvin Davis, those were his best friends. Actually, Larry Patterson and Marvin Davis was the instrument that, that allowed us to go to, to enter into the loft because they knew him, so they were our ticket in. And then afterwards, you know, everyone started meeting everyone and stuff like that. And the loft was just a place that was this gentleman's home he lived in. It was a loft. It was just um, a loft in Manhattan and the floor shook, you know, you thought that she was going to fall any, you know, any night. You thought the floor was going to collapse. He had one bathroom with a shower curtain that, that said to set you between, it was not even a door. But it was, it was just, it was family. And then later on, he had a grand opening. He, he purchased the loft next door and knocked the walls down and opened up that. And he had two lofts. So it was that, and then later on, you know, um, then other clubs started spurting, just started just coming about. Um, the Shelter, um, which was a competition for the Loft, and then um, after that was the Garage, of course. The Garage, of course. <laughs> of course, <laughs> so that's what happened. So Daryl, for people who don't know, what was the loft really like? What was going on there? And maybe Mark and Peter could also okay. go into their... You don't want me to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> tell it, tell it, please I want somebody it. to tell me. Yeah. You said Studio I 54, went, I, I got questions. One, one, last, one, one last thing, me. one last thing I will say about the loft was that back in those days, it was a sense of style. It was something that was like a, something in the air. You smell patchouli <laughs> and and incense, but you smell patchouli and um, must oil, a musk oil. Those are the two things. So everyone in the world, put, put, they went and got patchouli oil, and that was a big thing. You were not fabulous unless you had patchouli oil on. Created because of the sweat. The more you sweat, the more just nurtured. Yes, Mark. What? <laughs> Tell us, baby. What are we going to talk about? Well, Zanzibar, you know, I got a... The loft, the loft. Well, I got to say about Zanz, because we're, we're talking about the foundation of the club scene in Newark. And, you know, some deeper history. My dear mentor, Albert Murphy, turned it into major. But there was an individual that a lot of people don't realize was the cause of it being a Zanzibar. For those of you that remember, I mean, I was told this, it was first Abe's Lounge downstairs. And that's where uh, a young man was putting things together to create a Zanzibar. And his name was Chris Barnes, is Chris Barnes. Mm -hmm. And because of Chris's uh, a visionary and working with Miles Berger and the Berger Cooperation, Chris was one of the initial people, or the initial people, to take them to New York to see the Paradise Garage, to get into their heads that we needed something like this in Newark. So I'm just proud to say, throw that in, that Mr. Chris Barnes is with us tonight. Stand up, Mr. Chris Barnes. So that was how it was created from the door, and my dear mentor, got involved with Chris and Miles and turned it out to be what it was. The loft was a place that you had to have strong will, power, to do what necessary to make you feel good, but don't go overboard. The ambiance was balloons 
and huge pillows, and the loft part, which was his apartment, was upstairs, but on the weekends he turned it into, you know, a room for everybody. And it was just a great environment. The music, of course, was outstanding. I was a, a young kid just coming up from Savannah, Georgia, so I almost lost my mind um, <laughs> between uh, Newark and what was going in New York. So, you know, it was just heaven back in the days. And once you went in, you didn't come out until the sun was shining. Um, I would actually like to um, bring it back to something that everyone who spoke um, touched up on, and that is uh, mentorship and kind of being indoctrinated into these places through an elder or somebody who knew you and he was just like, oh, you have a pretty decent head on your shoulders, please come with us. Um, and that's kind of how I was indoctrinated into kind of Nork's um, LGBT community through um, elders and mentors who were really awesome. So could you, um, um, this is for anybody to speak about kind of mentorship and how that um, helped you grow not only within the gay community but within uh, Nork's gay community and the Zanzibar and the club scene. Well, my, my experience was, of course, Al Murphy, who later on, later on became my roommate. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he took me under his wing, of course. He later on became my roommate, and he, just, he taught me from soup to nuts. And, uh, but my mentor back in those days were, was Marvin Davis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Marvin Davis was, I wanted to be like Marvin. I wanted to look like Marvin. And Marvin and I were both Aries, and I would tell people we were years apart, but I would tell people we were twins, because we kind of, kind of similar, and maybe it's just in my head, looked like each other. <laughs> just a little bit, maybe because of the Afros. I don't know, <laughs> but anyway. Um, Larry, Patt Larry Patterson was also, mm -hmm. so those were my parents. You know, back in those days, you had parents, and those were my parents, you know, and um, I really give homage to them. Well, coming from Georgia, I was scared, nervous, and I don't know how I got involved, but I'm just honored that Daryl is here. Y'all know I'm emotional, so. Um, Albert Shelton Hayes, um, another mentor, uh, they taught me um, class, um, elegance. They enhanced my way of dressing. Daryl, you uh, fought. <laughs> and these were the people that took the younger crowd in that were already experienced, um, teaching us the do's and the don'ts, um, and at sometimes warning us of certain, you know, beings, because as Daryl said, they were the mentors and they were teaching us about life, and especially the gay life, because even back then, you know, we weren't um, considered as citizens. Uh, we were verbally abused and at some times physically abused because of our lifestyle. So when you had to deal with all of these issues of trying to find yourself, uh, uh, live a decent life, when you had these people like Daryl um, and the conglomerate of the, the mentors, they were the force behind us being uh, who we are today, and they're not here, most of them, but they did a good job. Well, for me, it was a little different. I came out, I hate to say this, several <laughs> after y'all. <Sure. laughs> but I think what I learned about Al Murphy, because I met him towards the end, towards okay. the end of Zanzibar and all those things, but what I loved about Zanzibar and that we've lost, and the club scene, not just in Newark, but his, in general, has no longer does. We y'all used to dress up, and y'all used to look so fabulous. And I used to want that was my goal to look like y'all. And I remember um, a long time ago um, that my cousin Carnell, right. he was a bartender at Murphy's, yeah. and he he told us that he was working <coughs> at this place, and we would drop him off there every night. But he was really a bartender at Murphy's, and I was the one who confronted him. I said, well, we dropped you off, but you walked down the street. <laughs> he said, I'm gonna take you somewhere, and you better not tell. And he took me to Murphy's, and then he took me to Zanzibar. Wow. And I was stuck <laughs> from that point on. 
Because to me, that was the epitome of making it. Because you, when you were growing, well, back in the day in the 80s and the 70s, all you had to do was look well. Mm -hmm. And that was the goal. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a few things that's different with our, my generation than with yours. When, we, when, when they started attacking us, we attacked back. Right. There was a difference. I think by the 80s, we had gotten enough of, you. oh, we're going to beat up the fags. Right. So now the fags was beating them up. Mm -hmm. So when they would come down to Murphy's to rob us, right. you know how we rolled. Right. We got them. Right. And that became, that became, that was the difference between, because we always thought of um, Al and Mark Sedane as to be the classy people. Like, wow, look how they look. They don't even argue. <laughs> and we and we and we was like and I remember going to Murphy's and putting on a silk shirt and some Levi jeans and you could, and that was it because that's what every they, they was dressed up. Now when you go to clubs, you get a T-shirt if you get that, and you'll get some cut-off shorts. Like there was nothing cut off well, then. I didn't know. There was nothing. If you didn't have a Fab shirt from Macy's, because you would go to Macy's in the morning <laughs> after school and you would get a look from the bargain basement. Who remember? And you would be done, because Wednesdays was Murphy's, Saturdays was Zanzibar. What was what was Fridays? Fridays, I think, was Zanzibar too. And Murphy's. And Murphy's. And Murphy's. And Murphy's. But what was the place that was in between that was on Springfield Avenue? That was on Springfield. No, not on Springfield Avenue. I'm, I'm sorry, Broad Street. And it was not. Oh, the, it was Docs. Excuse me. Docs. Docs. And that's when I knew I made it. So that was me. Wow. Well, <laughs> well, when you yes. talk about mentor mentorship, I think it's that's really important. When I got to Newark, it was long way after, you know, all of this wonderfulness. And I think one of the main things that I was taught, I came to Newark from Atlanta um, in the early, you know, in like early 2000s, very recently. And that was when Atlanta, you know, Atlanta is was like on fire with um, with lesbian parties. My neighbor in Atlanta was um, was a promoter. Um, she did a lot of the major parties in Atlanta at the time, and so I, I clung to her. So when I got to Newark, I was just all about, I want to do a party, I want to do a party, I want to do a party, and the mentors that I met, um, you know, people like June, they were like, well, you need to work for the community first before you start throwing parties thinking you know what they want. And so that was kind of the message that I, bought, I got because it was really, there was really a lot of work being done at the time. You know, June had started um, Newark Essex Pride Coalition <coughs> at the time, and Newark was gearing up for one of its earliest um, prides, and so it was really um, community driven. And so a lot of my mentors kind of drilled that into my head before I was able to kind of jump out there and do parties. Um, well, I'd just like to back it up a little bit. Um, I got to Newark in 1951 when I popped out of my mother's body. <laughs> and um, I tell you, growing up, um, whether you came from Georgia or not, I was scared too. <laughs> I had a dilemma, and my dilemma as I grew up was to figure out how I was going to live in the Newark of the 1960s and the 1970s as a gay person. Uh, and. Um, one of my dilemmas was I needed to dance. I wanted to dance. Uh, it was a way of spiritual release and how I was going to do that. So first, I'd like to dispel a few stereotypes. One is, it's not true that all white people can't dance. <laughs> and it's also not true that all black people can. Because right. right. I've been out on that dance floor and I have seen that. But at that time, my dilemma was, and particularly in the 1960s, late 1960s into the early 1970s, how was I going to a dance? How was I going to dance? And I mean dance freely with my body, abandon myself to the music in a culture, particularly in the Italian-American culture that I grew up in, where if you were a guy and you danced, you were a fag and you got beaten up. I went to a huge Catholic high school in Newark and gratefully there was <coughs> in that high school an African-American students organization 
and I joined. <laughs> <laughs> In those days, you could join. Um, and I joined, and I made many friends there, and I figured out that in the African-American community, if you were a guy and you danced, you weren't necessarily a fag. It was okay. And I first found one of the greatest spaces to dance right over here at the YMCA in Newark at these African-American fraternity parties. And while I did not have any mentors, I had friends there. And one of those friends, who was no longer with us, Lonnie Hobson was his name, uh, said to me, I want you to meet me at 2 o'clock in the morning on uh, Sunday morning, 2 o'clock Saturday morning. In those days, I was thinking uh, Saturday night, 2 o'clock in the morning and I am going to take you somewhere with me. So I snuck out of my mother's house. I went and met Lonnie, and he took me to this place over behind where Bambergers used to be. This would have been around 1967, 1968, and there was a place back there called DMI, Drafting Materials Incorporated. It was on the corner of uh, Market Street and Washington Avenue there. <coughs> and above it was this huge empty loft space. And there was a party going on. And uh, Lonnie and I were among the few people, I was the only white guy there, uh, and Lonnie and I were among the few people who were not dressed in women's clothes. And we danced our brains out until about one o'clock the next afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I learned that these were a series of parties that moved around the city. Uh, he took me to about uh, two or three of them. Um, and uh, uh, that led by sort of a chain reaction to other places to go and dance before actual gay clubs began to emerge that we could go and dance in. And interestingly enough, one of those places was located in uh, what is now Symphony Hall, used to be the Mosque Theater. Right. <laughs> it was the place where Channel 47 uh, there was a dance show there called Disco Team. Wow. And I met more gay kids there dancing incognito. I am so heartbroken that all of the footage of that whole era is gone. Because in those days, they used to take the film that they would film this show with, and they would erase it and use it over oh, again. So there are only two episodes or shows of that left on the internet. Um, and I can actually look at them and figure out and remember who all the gay people were that were there. And one of them actually turned out to be a very famous DJ, Richie Kazor, uh, who spun at Studio 54 for quite a long time. Um, so. Uh, it just sort of interests me, what did we do? How did we find these spaces? Well, it wasn't necessarily by mentors, but it was by friends in so many ways. Um, and then eventually, uh, clubs began to show up in Newark fairly, fairly early. Uh, one of them, interestingly enough, was over on North Fifth Street called The Other World. Um, and one of the most important things about that place was not only was it somewhere where you could also go and dance your brains out, and it was very well integrated, even in the early 1970s, um, but in the basement of that place was the formation of one of the first gay activist organizations in the city, the Organization of Gay Awareness. The the club let us use their basement to form this uh, organization. Great. 
And that was, you know, really, I think, something quite incredible as I uh, think back on it. Gratefully, the trail led for me to uh, Zanzibar and Le Jacques. Uh, and Murphy's, my favorite place to go <laughs> on Wednesday night and Sundays when I was bored and exhausted from being in the Paradise Garage all night. Um, and uh, it was just uh, a much different time. Uh, and it did seem to me in many ways, um, dancing in all of those places, that there was something church-like about it. Mm. It was, it, was it was spiritual. Yes, it, it was, was spiritual. spiritual. It was where yeah. I know I went to free my spirit from all that I had to carry with me during the week, every day, the chance of walking around any corner and being beaten up, which often happened, having to figure out what way I was going to walk to get home safely, um, how I was going to get to where I wanted to go to dance without getting the crap beat out of me or harassed in some way or another. So I just think it's important also to consider those aspects of what eventually led to the appearance of all of these wonderful clubs that are unfortunately no longer with us now. Great. Wow, I don't know how to follow mine. Do I need this? Microphone check. Okay. Hi, everybody. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Miss Teresa. I feel honored to be up here in front of this panel, these, the panel of experts and fabulous people. And I'm seeing a lot of people in the audience who let me in the club when I didn't have ID and all of that good stuff. I thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Ta-da, I'm here. Okay. Um, we talked about mentors. My mentor happened to be, of course, Mr. Shelton Hayes and uh, Miss Tracy Norman, better known as Tracy Africa. Shelton taught me how to count money, how to make sure a club is ran properly, how to come in and just execute things. And that led me to go on and have my own club, Miss Teresa's, which was formerly known as the Bridge Club turned into Mr. Reese's in the 2000s. However, to make a long story short, uh, a lot of people in the industry and a lot of people in the club business, you get to know who's who, and you get to know who's a mindset and who to listen to, who not to listen to. Happen to have Mr. Mark Sedane. I've joined him many a nights in my early 20s. 